Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful, wonderful day. It's a day where the family of God increased, Lord, in this church. We received new people here. We have wonderful visitors today. It's a beautiful, sunshiny day. The skies are clear. The air is fresh. What a wonderful day to come before you and worship your name. We ask, Father, for your angels to be with us and protect us and guide us through this study that your words would be heard and not man's, that I would disappear. We ask, Father, for the hearts to be open to hear your spirit speak because each one of us is individual and each one of us has a heart that only you know. We pray, Father, that you would filter the words to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for hearing. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us and keeping us on this Sabbath day. There is no God but you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the book of Revelation is, um, it's not a sealed book, it's an open book, unlike Daniel, which was sealed, but it is prophetic, and it was meant to be understood very easily, and it can be broken down and understood very easily when you use the Bible to unpack it. Now, what's being discussed in the book of Revelation essentially is the next 2,000 years of history from the time of Christ's ascension until the second coming. So the last 2,000 years of history on this planet is found in this book. And you have the seven churches, which we're not talking about today, but you'll notice as we do the seven seals, those that are familiar with the seven churches will see that there is a bit of a correlation between the seven churches, particularly the first four, with the first four seals. But what's happening in the seven seals is something a little different than what's happening in the seven churches. It's being viewed at from a slightly different angle, from a different perspective. And so we'll find out what that is by just breaking it down. Now we're only gonna be doing two seals today. We're just gonna start with those first two, but they're very important because they lay a foundation on which the rest of the study stands so that we understand simple things like what does the horse represent? And what do these colors represent? And when we have that understanding, we're gonna see that it will weave back through the rest of the time. So let's begin in Revelation chapter six, verse one. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the sea of sails, and, <clears throat> and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now it mentions that the lamb is the one that opens the seals. Now to identify this lamb, of course, I'm using, I've capitalized that, it's a divine title in this case, but if we look in the book of Revelation somewhere else, we can find the lamb being mentioned and identify this lamb more clearly. In the previous chapter, in the throne room, in verse one, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain and he came and took the book. This is the one that is opening the seals. Now, I have not gone into the full depth of what's happening in chapter five, but basically the revelators in heaven seeing no man is able to open this book. No one is open, able to open these seals, but only the lamb that has been slain is worthy to do so because if Christ had not succeeded in his mission on this earth, the next 2,000 years of history would have been very different. In fact, there probably wouldn't have been much history left. So Christ's sacrifice and his perfect life on this earth is the reason why he's able to open this, these seals because the next part of history that will take place is a direct directly correlated to his success in his earthly ministry. So we're gonna think now of the time of this happening. Obviously, he was, we know he was slain at that time in history, and so as we continue to unpack this first verse, let's talk now about the thunders. Now, in Job 37, verse five, it says, God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend, and there's been other studies I know that we had Seven Thunders and also Sanctuary Cleanse Part Two from the previous series, that the voice of God is represented by thunder. But thunder also is equated, or I should say, is sometimes referenced with something else. It's mentioned alongside something. So what do you think of I mean, it? I'm not looking for lightning, <laughs> right? Well, let's just look at it. First Samuel 2.17, I will call unto the Lord and he shall send thunder and rain. So rain and thunder are also mixed together in the scriptures being correlated together. Now if we go back to Job 37, let's look at what the next verse says in verse six. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. 
Now, the promise that God gave to his people was that he was going to pour out the Holy Spirit, right? Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. So you have water and floods are spirit and blessing. Hebrew parallelism, A, B, repeating. So when we look at God thunders marvelously with his voice and he's gonna pour out the gentle rain, it also mentions the heavy rain. So we know that there's two seasons for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. There's the early, the former rain, which took place when? 10 days after he ascended, right? So we're looking at the ascension of Christ to heaven. 10 days later, what happened? There was thunder and there was rain. There was Pentecost. So we're referring to Pentecost, 31 AD. Okay, so this lamb opening the first seal, Christ opening the first seal, what has just happened in, in God's church's history? The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, the last thing he said to them before he left, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. There was no way that the gospel was gonna go everywhere unless the Holy Spirit had been poured out. Now we need to introduce another idea, of course, that it's familiar to those that have heard presentations here before, is that of typology. Typology is incredibly important to understand. Ecclesiastes 1, verses 9 through 11. That which has been is what will be, and which is done is that what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. In this day and age, people are very confused and scared about the direction of the world, and what's going on on this planet, I heard in Sabbath school, right? We're, you know, the world is, is in turmoil. But we have the answers in this book. Yeah. Because the things that are happening or coming on this earth have been repeating through history and they're coming to a great climax. This Bible is the most important contemporary book in the world. In fact, as we go further along into the future, the book is even more contemporary. Because it's speaking e ever more clearly of the time that is just before us. And God has given everything that his servants need to know. So when we talk about, most assuredly, I say to you in John 14, 12, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. When he went to the Father, the Holy Spirit was poured out and what happened? His church was filled with the Holy Spirit and they performed miracles and they went to all the ends of the earth. In Colossians 1, 23, it was recorded. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So what happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out? So we're just looking at the seals. The seals are talking about thunder. The Spirit of God is poured out, his church, because we're matching this with history. It has to match history. His, you know, prophecies of no private interpretation. It's the historicist view, it has to appear in history. So the Pentecost experience, God's people are filled with the Holy Spirit and the gospel goes with a bang. Five million Christians by the end of the first century. Five millions, five million by the end of the first century. And what is the promise at the end? Typologically speaking, Matthew 24, 14. Christ said the gospel of this kingdom. Notice that I'm focused here on gospel gospel, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Yeah. Every creature under heaven preached in all the world, there is going to be a repetition of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the gospel going to the whole world. As it was in the first century, so it will be in the last. So it's with this framing that we now, we go continue in the first seal and continue to open it. In Revelation chapter six, verse two. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now the first thing, we're just gonna go methodically from the beginning to the end of the verse and break it down. Let's start with the word white. What does white represent? Purity, clean. So there's a wonderful verse that shows that, but it's in connection with something. And that's the fact 
that it once wasn't white. Leviticus 13.13 13. Then the priest shall consider and behold, if the leprosy have covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean. That hath the plague, it is all turned white. He is clean. It represents being clean too. Purity, like you said. So, in the Bible, in the Gospels, Christ is healing people. And he's also saying to them, your sins are forgiven, you arise and walk. He's equating directly the forgiveness of sins with that of being healed. And so leprosy also is a fatal disease. Sin is a fatal plague. And here God is saying through the priest that's going to do this, also representing him in type, is that he is the one that what? Pronounces us clean. Your sins are forgiven you. So this idea of the white horse, this idea of the color white is not just purity, but the fact that in order to be pure, Christ had to purify us. In Revelation 19.8, and to her, the church, it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You notice it says white, clean here too. Clean, Old Testament, New Testament, same words, locking together, and it's the righteousness of Christ given to his saints. They were once plagued, they are now pronounced clean. So this is the white horse. Now white is describing the horse, so now we need to identify the horse. In Isaiah 63, verses 11 through 13, then he remember, remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock, and where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Notice that it says, his people, his flock, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. He parted the sea. That led them through the deep, through the parted sea, as a what? A horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. So we have his people, his flock, a horse. Interesting. Now, a, a horse is also a beast, and we know this from before. A beast represents what? Also represents a kingdom. Okay. Well, here's another verse that talks about God's people in this way. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 3. And of course, Zechariah is kind of the Old Testament revelation. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah. Notice it mentions flock again. The house of Judah hath made him as his goodly horse in battle, in the battle. So this is his horse in the battle. So now, identifying the horse as God's people, it's not just God's people having been purified and made white, it's also for a purpose of what? For a battle. This is the perspective of the seals. In Zechariah 9, verse 10, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. So we see horse now also being referenced again to battle, but we also see bow tied in as well. We'll do bow in a moment. Now it says that he that sat on him, the white horse, he that sat on him, that's a very specific phrase and it is mirrored exactly again in Revelation 19, verse 11 and 13. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him, just the same as in Revelation 6 too, he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war, battle. It has to do with a contest. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So this is Jesus, but this also is directly pointing to what? The Scriptures, too. So the Gospel is going to be carried out through the world, through us, through his horse, but who is the rider? Who's the one that's in charge? Christ is the one that's in charge. The beast is a kingdom, and the rider is the one who's in charge of his kingdom. This is, a, you could look at this also in Revelation 17 where you have the whore in the wilderness with the red beast. She's riding that. That's, the, um, that's Babylon and she's riding that kingdom on this earth and God has his kingdom as well. Now let's talk about the bows. Now he that sat on him had a bow. Well if you have a bow, it doesn't do much unless you also have what? Arrows. Arrows. Second Kings 
13, 15, and 17. And Elisha said unto him, Take the bow, take a bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. And, Elisha, and then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of the deliverance from Syria, for, they sh for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek and thou, till thou hast consumed them. So this is battle again, right? The bows and arrows are for, for fighting. But the spiritual symbol, the significance of it is being defined here by the word of God, saying that this bow is to shoot arrows, and those arrows are what? The deliverance of God. It was the deliverance from his, of his people from the oppressors physically, temporally at that time, but it's also the deliverance of God in a spiritual sense as well. So let me add another verse to that that talks about bows and arrows. So I'm gonna, just going to shrink uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 7, so, so you still have it. But I'm going to add Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3, 12, and 13. He hath bent his bow, which means that you pull it back, right? He has bent his bow and he has set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. Now, I don't know, there was a message we had here a while ago. It was, a while, it was the True Tabernacle series ooh, over a year ago, and we really went into the word reins. It's called grab the reins, if you, any of you remember that. The reins, 8629 in Hebrew, it means the mind, it means the interior self. It means the depth of your soul. It's the, it's the very inside of who you are. So where is God shooting those arrows? Straight into our hearts. Wow. Okay, so this word deliverance, we find it also echoed in Romans 1.16 because what are we talking about here? We're talking about the battle for what? For our hearts and minds against sin, Right? Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's the word gospel again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And of course, you probably heard me mention it before, the po word power there is the word we get the word dynamite from. It's the Greek word dunamos. It's the great explosive power of God. So the gospel of Christ is what? Salvation. The Greek word for salvation here, 4991, it means to rescue, it means to deliver. Now this is the feminine use of the word. The masculine use of the word, 4990, is deliverer, is savior. The savior delivers his bride, his woman. And so the word salvation also means deliver. Now, if we go back to deliverance in the Hebrew, Hebrew word 8668, it means to rescue. It actually means salvation. So those words, though one is Hebrew, the one is Greek, they actually correlate and respond to each other, so it is the arrow of the Lord's salvation. It is the power of God unto deliverance from sin. And we are locked in a death battle for our lives with sin and God is shooting the arrows into our depths of our hearts with that bow riding the white horse. What are we participating in when we're his battle horse? Now it mentions a crown next, halfway through the verse now. It says, and a crown was given unto him. So let's talk about the crown. Now in 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but, an, but we an un incorruptible. So talking of salvation, Paul is relating this to being victorious against what? Sin. Striving for the mastery over ourselves, over temperate. So that means that we're dealing with our cravings and our feelings and our desires and we're bringing them in line with the will of God. So we're striving. There's, there's a work. There's a battle to be fought. And at the end of this, we receive a crown. Now, this word striving, it, it appears a few times in, in, the, uh, in the scriptures, and it also appears in, you know, uh, strive to enter the narrow gate. But I want to show you this one. It just plainly very says in Hebrews 12, 4, you have not resisted to bloodshed. What is bloodshed that's in battle, right? You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So this striving against, for the mastery is the striving against sin, and to be victorious in this is to receive a crown and the rider on this horse has a crown because he was able to open the seven seals yeah. in James 1 12 
He that is, he, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So you have temptation, you have resisting, you have temperance in all things, you have the crown of life to give unto those who conquer, who striveth for the mastery, and it mentions specifically those that what? Love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. It all ties beautifully together. So continuing a little bit more about this crown, in 2 Timothy 4, 5, and 8, it mentions again something connected with this crown. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And Paul's talking to everyone. He's not just talking to people that go around speaking publicly. He's talking about all of us, that every one of us should be able to give an evangelistic series to our neighbor. We are evangelists. We are his battle horse. We are to be that white horse. A crown of righteousness. He hath henceforth, he has laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. So we have the crown of righteousness being given to those that are working as evangelists, as in ministry, as in winning souls, as being that horse upon which the rider goes, shooting his arrows into the reins, into the hearts and minds of those he's winning. So what is God calling this church to do? What was his early Christian church doing? So now, historically, what was taking place in that first century? The Gospels were being written, and it ended, of course, with uh, Revelation being written at the end of the century, around 96 AD. That entire first century was filled with the Gospel going everywhere where God's people were that white horse, and he was riding with them by in the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, and many were converted. So what historically happened? What is supposed to happen with us? Yeah. Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father on his throne. Christ, in all his letters to the churches, he always mentions to him who overcomes. It's in Revelation 22. It's always mentioning overcoming. Because it's possible in Christ. It is possible. That's the power of the gospel unto salvation. So he overcame how? How did he overcome? How well did he do? Very well. What does God say there? Simply, what does it say in English that we can all comprehend? To him that overcomes, as I also overcame. In Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Now we're dealing with the last line. He went forth conquering and to conquer. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Through him that loved us. If you love me, he says, I love you. It's a relationship. And the result of relationship is what? Overcoming. Five million Christians at the end of the first century through this white horse galloping. Now, we have to go back, before we finish the first seal, we have to go back and take a look at the very beginning. We kind of skipped over it. I was waiting for now to talk about it, and it's the announcement of come and see. Who says that? After the lamb opened the first seal, one of the four beasts, who are these four beasts? Well, in the book of Revelation, in chapter four, it introduces these four beasts. And so here they are identified in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 4. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, and like unto crystal, in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So we need to identify what does this mean that the lion is the one that says, come and see. Now, Again, the first place and the best place to look, especially when your book of Revelation is to find somewhere else in the book of Revelation, you find that word and let that word be explained to you. So the lion, going back now to Revelation 5 where we saw the lamb that was slain, right? Who opened the seals. One of the elders said unto me, 
Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So this is the lion, of course, this is the same thing as the lamb. Now this doesn't mean that the four beasts is Christ, but it represents something, it represents this power. Because this lion, described in the first seal, because you see the, the, the beast that announces each one of these first four scrolls is directly related to what's happening in those seals. In verse two, again, of that, of that first seal, it says, and I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Because we're also supposed to receive those crowns as well, right? Now, the lion, I should say, the he that sat on this horse, he conquers and he goes to conquer. He's not losing any battles. And when we look up lion, we find another place where we see lion being described. It's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 30. A lion, which is the strongest among the beasts, and turneth not away for any. He doesn't lose. The white horse didn't lose. The white horse went to conquer and conquering five million Christians in the first century. What does God want to do in the latter reign on this earth? So I'm gonna show you a chart where we're gonna slowly populate this slide as we do the seven seals. Wow, that's all we did. I promise you, this entire thing is gonna be chock full of stuff. <laughs> it has to start slow and simple because we have to, what does the horse represent? What is being discussed in those seals? What is the perspective of it? It's the gospel work on this earth and those involved in it. It's the battle and what happens. So 31 AD, we have our starting time there. 31 AD, the white seal, the first horse. So let's talk about the second, second seal. Revelation chapter six, verse three and four. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now the first thing I want to do is what we just did last, which is let's talk about the beast announcing come and see. Now this beast, when it says come and see, the next thing that follows is a description of the horse, and that horse now is instead of white, it's red. It's the color of sacrifice. It's the color of blood. Let's take a look at what that second beast was. In Revelation 4, 7, that second beast is being described like a calf. Now if we take that word calf, and we go back in the Old Testament, we start finding where does it talk about a calf and what was it in re relation to. We find in Leviticus 9, verses 2 and 8. And he said to Aaron, take thee a young calf for a sin offering. And therefore went up into the altar. Aaron went up therefore into the altar and slew the calf of the sin offering. So we have a calf being equated with an offering. And the offering was done by what? Sacrifice. The calf was a sacrifice. So this the calf represents a sacrifice. How does that, you know, either for the plow or the sword? Now, this sacrifice has to be related to something other than obviously just animals. We're talking about what happened in history after that first seal was opened. After five million Christians in the first century, what began to happen to God's people at that time? Persecution. Persecution. 2 Timothy 4, 6, where we were looking earlier in 2 Timothy, now this verse, for I am now ready to be what? Offered. What does it say about the calf? Offered. Offering. I am now ready to, and he, he mentions I am ready to be poured out like a drink offering in another translation. I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul was going to die, and where did he die? He died in Rome. And who was it that was responsible for him dying? The Roman Empire, Roman Emperor Nero. So we're talking about now the transition from white to red horse. In 2 Timothy 3.12, the promise to us is, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it is only a natural result of the white horse riding that a red one was to follow. And it gives us the context of what this is about. Again, this is about the gospel work on the earth. So now we have a time for this because we know that Paul, Paul was sacrificed in 64 AD. And this is also in the great controversy backing this up that essentially persecution really began in 64 AD with Nero. 
of course, accelerated greatly after the first century and for the next two centuries leading up to when religious liberty was granted in 313, it was gladiators and lions and any which way that they could kill God's people for entertainment, they did so. It was bloody. It was a red horse. Now let's talk about the peace. This red horse and the power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Now if we pull up the word peace, we find it in a few places and notice what it's related to. Ephesians 6.15 And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You notice the gospel is again the, the whole point. The gospel of peace in Romans 10, 15, it talks about the gospel of peace again. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings for go of good things. Amen. So God is preaching, God is giving us the message to preach. He is essentially the one that's shooting the arrows into the reins because it's the Holy Spirit that brings it. We're just the vessels. We're just the goodly horse in battle but it is the rider that is there winning the souls with his word going straight to the heart and it brings peace between who? God and man and by bringing peace between God and man you bring the enmity of the world. In Matthew 5, 9 through 11 Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Peacemakers, righteousness, persecuted, persecuted. So this gospel that goes to the world is the gospel of peace, but when it works, it actually also brings what? Persecution. Now when it says to take peace from the earth, what was happening here is that they're trying to remove the gospel from the earth. Isn't that what it is? Because it's great enmity with God, and so when the gospel is given like this in, in a conquering way, those that resist this want to remove the gospel from the earth. And when you remove the gospel from the earth, what follows? Bloodshed. You just ask, well, study the French Revolution. So this peace obviously is talking about Christ. In Isaiah 9, 6, it speaks of him as a child is born a son is given to us and the government shall be on his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is the one that's at the heart of this. He is the rider on that horse. Everything centers around him. And you know what they did with him? They tried to remove him from the earth. In John 11, 47 through 53, then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? These are his own people. These are the leadership, his own people. For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. Whose nation was it? And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us. It is good for us. It is efficient for us that one man should die for the people that none, that the whole earth, not, no whole nation should perish. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. They went to remove peace from the earth. It's interesting, though, it is expedient that one man did die for all our sins, isn't it? God's will will be done. In John 19, 15, and 16, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto him, shall I crucify your own king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to be crucified. They took away Jesus. They took Jesus and led him away. Now it records in Luke 23, 12, what was happening behind the scenes for this to all take place. It said that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other for previously been an enmity with each other. What's going on in this world right now? Are we talking about the persecution of Christians already a bit? You know, they're, uh, yes, they are complaining about that a lot. Pushing, you know, the Bible out of schools, the public schools, pushing, you know, all these things that the, that the, who's Herod? Who's Herod? He's the king of, he's the king of the Jews, right, so he, who does he represent? I mean, what does he represent? He's representing who? His church. Who's Pilate representing? 
the state. That was the day that church and state became friends. And when church and state become friends again, the very same thing will take place on this earth, to take peace from the earth. In John 15, 20, remember the word that I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. History will repeat in type. That which was is what will be. There is nothing new under the sun. We know what's ahead of us. In Matthew 24, 7 and 9, Christ speaking prophetically in that chapter, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. What's happening here? Taking peace from the earth. And that's exactly what happens at the end. For his name's sake. Yeah. They will try to remove us from the earth. In John 16, 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Yeah. That's amazing to think. I mean, it's crazy. But what do we also have to fear? More, well, yes, you're right, nothing, right? Perfect love casts that all fear, but there's another thing. We have more to fear where? from within than without. Yeah. And they will conspire together to do that. In Revelation 13, 15 through 17, sort of like the great culmination of sort of that red horse in type. And he had power to give life into the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man may buy or sell save that he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I know I'm not going to be doing the seven churches today, and I'm probably going to do that in the future, but I'm going to give you something from the church of Smyrna. During that time in persecution in Rome, the Christians were asked to do a sign or a pledge of allegiance to the Roman Empire. And if they did this, then they could live however they wanted to and worship whatever God and do whatever they did. But they had to do this first. And it was to throw some incense into the fire and say Roma Dea, which was the Roman goddess. And if you did this, then it showed that you had pledged allegiance. You had received the mark. Either Maybe you don't believe it. It's not gonna be received in your forehead. But you did it with your hand. You threw the incense into the fire and you said it was like praying to Roma Dea. It was acknowledging the God of Rome. And then you could do whatever you wanted. And the Christians died for that. Yeah. That's the same thing here with the mark of the beast. Now I want to add something now. We talked about the gospel of peace, right? The peace, the gospel of peace. So let's talk about the sword and let's add the word peace to the sword. Because we're talking about take peace from the earth to kill one another and he was given unto him a great sword. In verse 4 of Revelation 6, Matthew 10, 34 through 36, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. For I, am, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Who's riding that white horse? Sorry, who's riding the red horse? Still Jesus. He's still riding his church. Think not. He's not giving up on us. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. A household shall represent a church. Now the word sword there in Revelation 6, 4, it is Greek word 3163. It is the word that we get just like dunamis is dynamite. This word gives us machete for hacking and slashing. Yes, that's where that Greek, it, the machete comes from the Greek originally, and that's what that great sword is in Revelation 6, 4. God brings peace, but the peace with God that you have with him brings enmity of the world. Yeah. Now, what is this word? What is this sword that's being talked about? What does the Bible say that this sword is? In Hebrews 4, 12, it says, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If it's able to go into between soul and spirit, it is also going to go between mother and father and child and husband and wife and brother and sister. 
But what is it ultimately doing there at the very bottom of that verse? Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, that's a lot like Lamentations 3, 12, and 13 from the first horse. His bow set me as a mark and caused the air of his quiver to enter into my reins to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. And this is where all the great pushback comes from. Because they don't want it. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be corrected. I don't want to give up my selfishness. I don't want to give up my pride. I don't want to give up the way that I do things. It cuts like a knife. It hits us like an arrow. But it saves our soul. So the red horse rides after the white because that true revival, that true experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit and the gospel going out like, like thunder brings with it persecution. Let's go back to our chart. I'm going to add the second horse there. Notice it's still not filling in very much. But that second horse began, we know, we can say in 64 A.D., when Paul said, I was offered, I'm being offered, and that calf said, come and see, and the sacrifice of God's people began. And by the way, it didn't work. Trying to remove the peace from the earth by killing God's people off, it actually, the reason cha- Satan had to change his tactics, and we're going to talk about the next week when I do the third seal next Sabbath. Satan had to change his tactics. But so far, just from studying these first two seals, What does it say about our calling? What is our purpose here? What must we expect? What should we expect in the white horse experience? What should we expect will come in the red horse experience? What is our experience today? I don't think we have a red horse experience today. I don't think we have a white horse experience today. I think we're actually one of the other horses right now. Now these horses rode in the beginning from the first century through, we go through basically the time of the Gentiles through the Dark Ages. Because when we get to the end of the Dark Ages, what happens there? That's the beginning of the end, right? Yeah. Not the end, it's not the end of time, it's the beginning of the, the, the time of the end. So these four horses cover God's church's history from the early Christian church all the way through to the time of the end. And they happened in sequence just like there was a historical events, one, th- one through four, those four horses, those four churches, but something's gonna happen where this repeats again, just like it says in Ecclesiastes. So as we continue to study these seven seals, this is really telling us and preparing us from all of these studies, from all of these horses, what we need to understand and be ready for in the last days and to have faith. This word is going to be executed just as it's given. Yeah. His word never fails. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the book of Revelation. We thank you for your word, but specifically this book, which you say that we may receive a blessing to him that hears, to him that reads, to him that keepeth the sayings in this book. We thank you, Lord, for that promise in reading your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that you give in it. Please, Father, fill us with thy spirit. Help us to be discerning and wise and understanding the signs around us that we would be open enough in our hearts to be convicted to allow that arrow to penetrate all the way deep into our hearts. And that your will would claim the homage of our will. And we would choose to serve you. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen.